look up at the sky, you might see this. UFO sightings in New York have nearly doubled since the pandemic. You gotta see this. <laughs> It's a crack. But I'll tell you something funny. If you knock this wall down, the crack would stay put because the crack isn't in the wall. Where is it then? Everywhere. In everything, it's a split in the skin of the world. Two parts of space and time that should never have touched. Pressed together. Right here in the wall of your bedroom. And you know what that means? What? You need a better wall. You're listening to the Synaxis Podcast. I'm Jordan. I'm Josh. Today we're talking about a UFO book. It is The Alien Disclosure Deception by Charles Upton. came out in 2019, and we're looking at the first chapter today. Yeah, it's Cracks in the Great Wall, UFOs and Traditional Metaphysics by perennialist and traditionalist author Charles Upton. He's a really interesting guy, and you should definitely check him out. Yeah, I definitely have like certain contentions with him, but we don't need to get too much into that. We talked a little bit about perennialism in our first episode, and I feel like we should do one eventually. Yeah, I would, kind of just like I a deep so, dive on it. Uh, yeah, generally perennialism, I guess we should talk about, if you haven't heard, it's it's the idea that there are multiple revelations and uh, most of the main religions in the world are, are kind of different uh, manifestations of one divine truth. Um, and it was formulated by Rene Guénon and Frithjof Schuon. They're these two philosophers and metaphysicians. They became pretty popular in like early to mid 1900s. It's based primarily on like Hindu Vedanta, but one of the big things that the traditionalist school, people like Rene Guénon talk about, is the uh, the Hindu idea of like the manvantaras and the cyclic uh, nature of reality. And he thought that we were in the Kali Yuga, which is kind of, it's also called the Iron Age. And it's analogous to the, the idea of end times in Christianity. Yeah. It's like when the universe has the most entropy. Everything's gone from being orderly to more chaotic. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Uh, and, and he wrote a book. One of his most influential books is called The Reign of Quantity. It's about um, critiquing the scientific worldview, materialism, and the uh, mainstream uh, departure from traditional spirituality. Um, so that's what, in a nutshell, that's what perennialism was about. And that's the, the point of view that Charles Upton is writing from. It's definitely not an orthodox way of looking at things. And we're not, I'm not, not necessarily championing that point of view. But I think that he is still very insightful with all of his... Uh, his stuff about UFOs, because I think, he, I, for the most part, I think he's spot on with his analysis. And he he references Father Sarah from Rose a lot, um, which is always good. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah I was going to bring that up. He definitely has <laughs> some respect for uh, Sarah from Rose, and he quotes him quite a bit in his books. Yeah, and he, he has a lot of respect for Christianity and orthodoxy in general. And I think I was saying before we started recording, I mostly agree with a lot of his viewpoints, but from a distance. Yeah. I don't fully accept. There was a time where I was more accepting of, of where he's coming from, but uh, this episode's not necessarily about trying to straighten all that stuff out. Um, we're going to talk about aliens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's what we're doing. <laughs> um, and it's, yeah, it's a super timely book anyway. I mean, this, I think I said 2019 at the beginning. This came out in 2021. And we've been seeing a huge upsurge in UFO sightings and just a lot of things in popular culture talking about UFOs. And it's kind of mind numbing. Yeah, following like, what, 15 or 20 years of like straight TV propaganda about it. I think Ancient Aliens or something on History Channel is on like its almost 20th season or something. I don't know how quick they pump seasons out now, but it's been a long time of steady like seeding of certain kinds of information. Man, yeah, I didn't even know it was still going. But yeah, anybody alive right now, I'm sure, has been exposed to the UFO mythology, even if they don't take it seriously. It's pretty widespread and mainstream. I mean, there are a ton of cults in the 60s that worshipped UFOs. Heaven's Gate, The Raelians, Urantia Book. And there are so many UFO cults. Yeah, it's worth taking like a deep dive online. Like, Type in UFO cults and see how many of them have arose since the 60s. Because I didn't really know that a lot of them were 
from the 60s but i was only aware of them because in like the 2000s i had some friend come up and you know bring it up to me and be like oh have you ever heard of the, the pleiadians or the reptilians but until that point i hadn't heard of it but i guess steadily since the 60s like people have been talking about this kind of stuff yeah and i want to shout out movie salt's video on it she has one um it's called esoteric analysis of the ufo and alien narrative uh part one kind of goes into her personal experiences with it part two traces a lot of the history of it but even that doesn't it's so widespread and wide ranging that even that is only a little bit of it but there's so much in that i didn't even know so i want to yeah it's a really good channel definitely check out movie salt yeah yeah i want to plug her she's she's awesome check out the esoteric analysis of the ufo and alien narrative because there's so much in there sci-fi and like all these ufo channelers and more cults than i i could even count but to get into charles upton's book i guess right out of the gate uh, it's demons. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with that. <laughs> yeah. It's it's not extraterrestrial biological things that have come from light years away to come visit Earth. Yeah. So yeah. So it's um, he he definitely compares these. He he goes with Father Seraphim, who he cites a lot. Uh, Father Seraphim Rose wrote Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future. There's a chapter in there called Signs from Heaven, where he is taking a look at UFO phenomenon, and he was writing that in like the 70s, I think. And, and their analysis is, is basically the same because Father Seraphim will take examples from uh, early saints, late, late antiquity, and it, even coming up to today where they, they had paranormal experiences, especially with demonic encounters when pagan magic was a lot more prevalent um, and people were actually communing with these entities. And, uh, and a lot of the modern UFO phenomenon seems to line up with that, that kind of experience. But since Upton's coming from like more of a perennialist comparative religions perspective, he says that these UFO shenanigans are the workings of the jinn specifically for him. Um, and the jinn, according to Islamic belief, are beings that dwell between the psychic and material plane of existence. But they are analogous to Christian demons. Yeah, it's the, people have to know the concept of the genie, like from yeah. Aladdin and stuff. That's <clears throat> that derives from jinn, which are looked at as yeah, kind of you know possibly neutral, sometimes malevolent or benevolent, but kind of. Mm -hmm. shouldn't be messed with either way in a sonic thought (laughs) yeah exactly and in upton's view it's the evil satanic jinn that are ultimately behind all this ufo stuff for the purposes of deceiving the world into accepting a new spiritual paradigm alongside father seraphim rose he also cites jacques valley who was a french uh, ufo researcher who worked with the u.s government and he was he's pretty highly regarded in ufo circles Something notable about him is he doesn't really agree with the mainstream idea that UFOs are extraterrestrial. His findings associate the strange reports of UFO encounters um, with the historical accounts of like fairy folk or gods or demons and other metaphysical entities. He's got a book called Passport to Magonia that compares these two. And there's also You Have Wonders in the Sky. Yeah. And I have Messengers of Deception. Yeah. Which is the one that's closer to Cracks in the Great Wall. Wonders in the Sky is just historical accounts of things that can be interpreted oh, okay. like extraterrestrial or interdimensional. It's a lot of like lights in the sky, discs that are on fire and historical gotcha. wars, things like that. And this is actually uh, one a short little section from his book, Messengers of Deception, Why UFOs mm-hmm. Are Important. I believe there is a machinery of mass manipulation behind the UFO phenomenon. It aims at social and political goals by diverting attention from some human problems and by providing a potential release for tension caused by others. The contactees are a part of the machinery. They are helping to create a new form of belief, an expectation of actual contact among large parts of the public. In turn, this expectation makes millions of people hope for the imminent realization of an age-old dream, salvation from above, surrender to a greater power, and some wise navigators of the cosmos. Yeah, definitely a good excerpt. Um, cause even though he, he associates the UFO stuff with the fairy folk and the gods and the djinn and everything, he doesn't necessarily think they're good or evil, but he, he does think the, uh, the modern sci-fi alien mythos is like a, a psychological projection that humans are putting onto it. And they're actually, as we'll see, that might be part of the social engineering to, yeah. to actually, um, engineer this new kind of religious consciousness, but the full extent of all of this phenomena is even more complicated because Upton writes, according to Valley, the UFO phenomenon has three aspects. One, it is a real and inexplicable phenomenon that appears on radar and leaves physical traces. Two, it is a psychic phenomenon that profoundly affects people's perceptions. And three, it is surrounded by deceptions of the Mission Impossible variety 
produced by actual human groups, apparently for the purpose of affecting mass belief. That's from the Alien Disclosure Deception, page 31. Uh, Upton continues, he says, but how can we possibly put these three facts together? If UFOs are physically real, we say they must be spaceships. If they are psychic, they must be either the product of mass hysteria or real entities. If they are staged, how can they be either? The mind grapples for closure. It tries to make sense of this, fails and shuts down. It is meant to. That's from page 32. I guess we can take each point, each of these points uh, one at a time. Yeah. Uh, the first one is physical phenomenon. I mean, people see alien crafts. They usually behave in ways that don't that aren't really explained by modern physics or anything. Yeah. Yeah, or at least not with our, like, modern kinds of uh, aerial vehicles and stuff, yeah. Yeah, um, just their flight patterns are, like, super erratic. And even with the, the new stuff, which who knows if it's a PSYOP or not, but there's a lot of the, like, blips on Navy radar, things that imply that there's a real physical thing going on and not some form of, like, mass hallucination. Yeah, exactly, and they seem to leave traces on the ground. Maybe crop circles. But, yeah, I was going to say maybe. Um, and a lot of people's experiences like electronics get messed with mm. like there's some kind of EMP or something like car batteries fail and cell phones mess up and, and lights flicker and go yeah. out and stuff like that and that's even a correlation to like spirit stuff in a bunch of occult kinds of yeah uh, theories for sure like the Taoists and stuff definitely have the idea that those beings mess around through like the electromagnetic spectrum hmm. and that that's just a part of like manipulating what they would say is like yin and yang chi mm -hmm. and that's it just has to do with electromagnetism so those things since what Upton would say is they're infrapsychic or, you know, they're in the etheric. They're like slightly above our realm that they they can mess around with those things. And that's how they say things like automatic writing and where like your body is partially taken over is yeah. that they put like the elect they use electromagnetism to like put electrical signals into your body to like slightly move you. And yeah. Stuff. And it like goes along with influence it. parts of your brain. And yeah, stuff. totally. It's crazy. Um, which goes into number two, psychic, which is also mixed with physical. So they're like. Um, I mean, Upton quotes Father Sarah from Rose to help explain how these phenomena can be both physical and psychic at the same time. He says, the most puzzling aspect of UFO phenomena to most researchers, namely the strange mingling of physical and psychic characteristics in them, is no puzzle at all to readers of orthodox spiritual books, especially the lives of saints. Demons also have physical bodies, in quotes, although the matter, in quotes, in them, is of such subtlety that it cannot be perceived by men unless their spiritual doors of perception are open, whether with God's will in the case of holy men or against it in the case of sorcerers and mediums. Orthodox literature has many examples of demonic manifestations which fit precisely the UFO pattern, apparitions of solid beings and objects, whether demons themselves or their illusory creations, which suddenly materialize and dematerialize, always with the aim of awing and confusing people and ultimately leading them to perdition. The lives of the 4th century St. Anthony the Great and the 3rd century St. Cyprian the former sorcerer are filled with such incidents. It is clear that the manifestations of today's flying saucers are quite within the technology of demons. Indeed, nothing else can explain them as well. The multifarious demonic deceptions of Orthodox literature have been adapted to the mythology of outer space. Nothing more. Their purpose is to awe the beholders with a sense of the mysterious and to produce proof of higher intelligences angels if the victim believes in them or space visitors for modern men and thereby to gain trust for the message they wish to communicate and then just to back that up both upton and father seraphim quote this study from the library of congress for the u.s air force it's called uh, ufos and related subjects and annotated bibliography and they quote it as saying, Many of the UFO reports now being published in the popular press recount alleged incidents that are strikingly similar to demonic possession and psychic phenomena, which have long been known to theologians and parapsychologists. So he, uh, they're not the only ones that have made this connection yeah, for sure. with, with demonic activity. Yeah, I think it's like three quarters of like the world's religions have some idea of like spirit possession or mm. something like channeling involved in it. So like a lot of like the New Age stuff like this that doesn't exactly have to be like abductions but like there's a huge amount of people who like sit in their room with like no youtube followers who say that they're just channeling aliens from different starships and stuff or star you know star systems and different planets and stuff and it's the kind of thing that doesn't really make sense because they're not making like money off of it mm -hmm. maybe if they're like one of the you know sheldon nidal or someone who it, it writes books and makes money off being one of like the galactic federation of light or like pleiadian people 
like the amount of people who are like, oh, you can just open yourself up energetically and things can talk to you and send you messages. It's it's pretty much every form of classical, like occult, like channeling or, or being a medium. It's it, But yeah. now it's just like wrapped up in some form of like, oh, it's just space beings and they want to talk to you. Yeah, it's astounding how, how much of that there actually is. It really is. Ast- especially like looking at stuff, it's like, man, look at any form of shamanism anywhere and mm-hmm. like see how much of this is going on. Yeah, and the Ascended Masters, all that yeah. New Age stuff. There's too many to name, really. Um, and that kind of goes into like um, what R- Rene Guénon kind of what talks about. Because this chapter in Charles Upton's book is called Cracks in the Great Wall, and that's a reference to Rene Guénon's The Reign of Quantity. He's got a chapter in there called Fissures in the Great Wall. And he, he, kinda, he symbolically talks about a traditional society as a walled city where... Um, The walls around it are a protection against basically like demonic activity. He calls them the hordes of Gog and Magog. And but it's since it's a a walled city, it's open towards the sky, which is symbolic of divine influence. Yeah, from above. Which is above you for sure. The walled garden is almost like Eden. Yeah, it kind of is. Yeah, the walled garden, and yeah, and like I said, that's his illustration for a traditional society, where it has these buffers against like. nefarious influences but it's also open to the divine from above and then his metaphor is kind of the scientific materialism of the modern times has put a dome over the the walled city um which has cut off for all intents and purposes yeah. the influence of divine realities it's made us more he calls it a solidification yeah and it's caused cracks to form in the wall so that these demonic influences can start seeping through and that's kind of the metaphor Charles Upton is is using for his whole thesis of these uh, strange encounters. And it's not just materialism, because like Rene Guénon says, like materialism can only go so far until people are still their souls are still like hungering for some kind of spirituality. Yeah. But since we've kind of capped off traditional religious thought, then all of these um, infra psychic influences will start coming in and taking the place yeah. of of divine realities. And this process is also helped along by black magicians and people who are servants of this of these dark powers. Yeah, whether knowingly or not. Yeah, whether knowingly or not. I mean, the biggest examples of those are like Aleister Crowley and Jack Parsons was a huge one. Um, who he brings up in this book because he's kind of like the the nexus of like the scientific materialists who are also dabbling in dark magic, who are very deliberately trying to open portals to another world to bring in these beings that they worship to them they're gods but to anybody with kind of like a christian or a traditional religious perspective they can see how demonic this actually is and that's just kind of that's what i see happening and that's what charles upton's thesis kind of is too which that goes into the third the third category of ufo phenomenon human deception um mostly like on the government kind of intelligence level and steering it in a propagandistic direction yeah like mirage men mirage men is a really good example of like provable governmental psyops in ufo communities that's that documentary where there are like conspiracy journalists who are trying to get to the bottom of ufo phenomenon and then what is he an fbi agent no uh, he's it's the air force office of special investigations af Oh, nice. yeah. Yeah, so I think his name is Richard Doty. Yeah. And he kind of comes in and at, he he feeds them false information. Yeah, he. I think it started that a long time ago that there was this guy who lived across from like a military base. I'm not exactly sure where. Maybe in New Mexico. And he was a retired some kind of military person. And he started getting uh, like radio signals off the base. And he had all the kinds of things to decode it. Mm. And... And then I think that some of the stuff he was getting was secret aircraft kinds of stuff. So Richard Doty, who worked for like the special investigations part of the Air Force, started feeding this guy like fake information. Mm-hmm. And and this was before he was really known as a disinformation person. Richard Doty be- ends up becoming infamous uh, in UFO circles and MUFON, like the mutual UFO network, for being a disinformation agent. Yeah, He would go around and tell people stories. And the documentary is him oh, he's retired now and he says he's just a civilian and it's him admitting to pretty much feeding the UFO community fake stuff about 80% of the time. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, I'll give him some true things, but a lot of the times it was, 
given fake kind of stuff but the the famous case that the documentary goes over is paul benowitz the guy who he feeds all this information to ends up pretty much going crazy and like losing his business i think he gets put in an insane asylum mm-hmm. he's convinced that he's communicating with aliens and they're going to take over the world and it turns into nsa gets involved and they start taking stuff from his computer they go across his house and rent a house and send signals that he can interpret and it becomes like a psyop where they're intentionally feeding this guy bad information knowing that he's going to try to give it to people and ufo communities and man yeah it's been a while since i've seen that but i do remember that and it's free on youtube i think you just got to watch it with ads but if you uh-huh. type in mirage man anyone who's listening to this can just watch it it's, it's one of the better documentaries on ufo stuff for sure yeah and that's yeah that's so crazy like there's just this uh tangled web that they weave of just mass deception for and in that it didn't i don't know if they ever really talked about why he would do that mm-hmm. it just kind of throw just to throw people off and confuse everyone. yeah it's it, people still don't really trust it like he's, he's still like a character online like richard doty i think does stuff on like gaia tv i'll see like interviews on youtube channels and stuff about him huh. but it's pretty like it's pretty split a lot of the people are like never trust this guy this guy worked for like a special investigation group that fed disinformation to ufo people don't trust this guy Mm. but i think even like as up to a year ago he's still doing videos saying that he's helping disclose the truth about aliens that the ufo uh, that the government is in contact with and this guy's just a disinfo guy like i would trust almost nothing the guy said (laughs) you know he's giving you stuff on aliens it's you shouldn't trust it and that kind of stuff goes into the sort of mythos of like the men in black who's yeah, like absolutely. These, these weird mysterious agents that show up after all these encounters and either they either try to shut everything down and like cover it up or they re- leak some kind of yeah. inside information so i remember another story in in upton's book later on in a different chapter he talks about one of the first encounters with ufos in like the 40s at puget sound there was this guy who I think he was a Coast Guard or something, if I remember right. And he, he saw some kind of weird aerial phenomenon. It actually led to like an explosion that killed his dog. And then he went and told his boss about it, who it turns out was an ex-OSS officer. And then later he also was contacted by like an Air Force guy who had seen a UFO. So they were going to get together and compare notes and stuff. And when they went to meet up in, I want to say like Toronto or some big city, they were trying to find a hotel to stay at so they could talk and they already had a room booked for them oh yeah and all the rest of the rooms were booked out but they had one reserved in their name yeah Yeah, i remember this they had one reserved in their name so then they met and they talked about their experiences and then everything they said had been leaked to the press so it it must have been bugged or something but then like men in black started coming to to kind of try to shut them up but the way upton talks about it is it's like it's all seems it all seems actually set up to have this reverse psychological effect where it's like we're trying to hide this but we also want to get this information out yeah at the same time and that um that goes into what he talks about about the, these mind control techniques that that are used upton okay. identifies two main ones subliminal contradiction and deferred closure yeah so this is page 72 in the alien disclosure deception he says in the technique of subliminal contradiction two mutually incompatible bits of information are simultaneously projected into the perception of the victim without the contradiction being either pointed out or explained and that's something father seraphim talks about in uh in his book because he notes that all these ufo encounters have these weird just like absurd details there's one where the pancakes one yeah like yeah. A, a ufo landed in like the there's like a tall green man or something that gave people a stack of pancakes and, and like asked for butter or something it's yeah. totally some ridiculous kind of unexpected thing yeah I mean, that was an official one like they went and he went and told the police or whatever he's like yeah they showed up and uh-huh. had pancakes and... and i think he i think father Sarah from quotes jacques valley is saying like this the absurdity of this induces like a hypnotic state in people and that's that's part of like it, yeah. ma- it makes people suggestible yeah, because you're trying to find a resolution for what's really going on when it doesn't make sense. So you start being like more open to what kind of resolution it could be. That immediately made me think of Darren Brown. Yeah. You showed me him years ago. Yeah, I was, I was really into Darren Brown for a long time. What was and, his show called? Uh, Mind. Trick of the Mind. Trick of the Mind. Something like that, for sure. When he would like just on the street, like fool people where he, he went up to them and, and he'd be like, there's a wall in my yard that's four feet tall. Yeah, my gate's not four feet tall. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, what? And he teaches people to do that in one of the things too. He try, he gets a group of people to try to 
to steal from a store. And if they're caught, that's they're supposed to hit him with one of those things that like stops your brain by uh, like mixing categories. And that's one of the things he says is you, you tell them that my gate's not four feet tall and you look confused. And there's like a section of the population that when you hit them with something like that, like it's it's like a roadblock, like mm-hmm. they get hit by it. And all of a sudden your response is so different from the reaction that would be expected from a normal person. Yeah. That it almost like freezes the other person. You're like, what? Yeah. And he'll do the thing where he goes to shake their hand, but then he grabs it in a weird way. Yeah. It's a handshake interrupt. Yeah. It's totally, yeah. That's like, that's like the rapid induction. That's a really common way to what they how the hypnotists or NLP people describe it is yeah. you interrupt um, unconscious motor function functions. So something someone's done a million times, like handshake, uh-huh. you don't consciously think of how to do it. And when you interrupt things like that and usually do something startling, so they grab your hand and they pull it or yeah. say something that you can put people into a, a trance like situation just based on the surprise. Yeah, it stuns you into a state where you can be easily manipulated. Yes, yeah. I remember some of those Jaron Brown NLP is neuro linguistic programming for anyone who doesn't know. But I remember him. He's like, a mentalist. He had a bunch of, yeah, he's a mentalist. And he had like a bunch of pieces of blank paper and he would go into like convenience stores and he would do that. He would throw them off, like hit them with the subliminal contradiction and then pay with blank money and they wouldn't notice until he was yeah. gone. And he, and he would do things like uh, intentional psychological um, techniques. Like, so there's certain, so a lot of like esoteric black magic stuff mm-hmm. and a lot of the modern stuff, the people who write about it, like they're all NLP practitioners and they're explicit about it. And yeah. they, they say that because words affect the mind in a certain way that they want to be able to strategically use words to affect people. Uh-huh. It's like technique, it's like a form of technology or magic. And one of the things he does in the paying with paper thing is he would go in and pay with paper and he would get them to, he would ask them a question that made them respond in the affirmative because there's something, it's like the car salesman technique. Mm -hmm. You want people to say like, oh, it's a beautiful day outside. Like, oh, is this your wife? Like you ask questions that they know are a yes. So you get in the habit of responding yes to this person. Yeah. And then he would do something like he would ask him a direction and he would point to the wrong direction. He's like, oh, so it's the subway north. And he would point like east, Yeah. you know, and he would do stuff like that. And something about hitting people with these kinds of things. They all of a sudden can't really pay attention to what they're doing. And yeah, he got away. He didn't get get everyone, but I think like 80% of the people in New York he walks up to and does this thing on, mm-hmm. he gets away with it. He, there's this guy he buys like a ring from, totally works. The only person that doesn't really work on is like a street vendor selling hot dogs. Like the guy who's used to getting scammed, he, he's like, oh, and when he hands him the thing too, he says a subconscious command where he's like, oh, mm-hmm. my brother said that uh, I shouldn't take the safe subway. It's dangerous. But he, he said, no, it's fine. Take it. No, it's fine. Take it. Yeah. As he's handing them yeah. the money. And things like that really do psychologically affect people. Man. Yeah, that whole process of like stunning them with a a contradiction, making them more suggestible, and then putting a command in there subliminally. Um, Man, that's so trippy. And you see examples of that. Charles Upton would say you see examples of that all the time in the UFO stuff. Yeah. And that goes into deferred closure, which was the second one. In the technique of deferred closure... Inexplicable data are continually fed to the victim or victims over a period of time. Data that always suggests the possibility of a rational explanation but never quite allow it. And since the human mind is designed to seek and produce both perceptual and rational closure, the mind subjected to deferred closure will react to the continued frustration of one of its most basic needs either by sinking into stunned exhaustion or producing a paranoid delusional form of closure. Um... And Upton talks about how like the government will be really cagey about saying there's absolutely no UFO stuff, but then other people will kind of hint that maybe there is, and yeah. and it and it causes people to try to reconcile those things and find closure themselves. And he gives the example of like if you had somebody in a prison and you gave them like a whole bunch of different objects that didn't have anything to do with it with each other, like a Barbie doll and like a tin can and uh, a screwdriver or something. And have them give them the assignment of making some kind of overarching narrative between the things. They would come up with something and then they would almost fall in love with it because they made it up. Yeah. And they came to this conclusion by themselves. And uh, and his idea is that that's what they're doing on a mass level to everybody through all this that's like one of the common mentalist things too i think you don't want to when you want people to think a thing you don't tell them you give them the steps so they feel like they come up with it on themselves you Mm -hmm. like give them the sum like an addition problem but you don't say the the solution so that they feel like the thing that you're leading them to is something that they thought of themselves yeah they're totally written about that being a far more convincing way to to affect people yeah in the notes we have all this stuff about like the disclosure project um 
That was the Rockefeller one. Yeah, right? Lawrence Rockefeller. Totally. Yeah, yeah, that was the one that, that that started a long time ago with people coming out saying that they all, you know, it's a disparate people who all have that same like deep throat vibe where they're like, I work for the government. Let me tell you the thing that happened. And they, they went on for a lot of years, but mostly those things have like conflicting stories. Like I remember being really interested in it when I was like 18 or 19 and being like, whoa, this guy got in like a laser fight with reptilians under a base in New Mexico. <laughs> and then like the dude who would come out like in the same program would be like, reptilians aren't even real we don't have bases there i met up with the zeta reticulans and the grays it was like so many conflicting mutually exclusive stories that couldn't all be true hmm. and i at that time i was kind of like what's going on and like look at all these government people and then i was like oh this is one of the rockefellers <laughs> like instantly more skeptical i'm like dude am i getting baited into a thing right yeah. now like yeah when you see the rockefellers or any of those big elite aims funding something yeah it's gotta it's kind of sus i instantly i'm like oh no <laughs> like i'm getting baited into a thing right now huh <laughs> and more recently there was the uh the two the stars academy yeah with blink one yeah guys. i was What's just i forget name? that guy's name but it's the same it's the same thing it's like this government guy told me tom DeLong. tom DeLong. yeah government people are telling me secret stuff and i feel like the way that because government has like a changing of guard where it's not the same people you know, like a long time ago, they'll be like, oh, there's no such th there's no such thing as UFOs. It's all just some kind of weather balloon stuff. Mm -hmm. And then people show up later and they're like, oh, look at all the stuff they secretly did. I'm the new insider. I'll tell you what the guys in the government before were hiding from you. Yeah. And it just it keeps an open door for constant psyops where anyone who works for some intelligence agency is like, actually, let me tell you what the dudes before were lying about. Right. Insert narrative for world government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think if I remember right, when Tom, one of, I don't know how many times he's been on Rogan, but one of the times Tom DeLong was on there, he said that he had written his own book about UFOs from his own personal research. And then some guy hit him some up. government guy came and they're they like how did you figure this out you know you know so much like yeah. maybe you should work with us now and now he's a spokesperson for yeah appeal to pride for a minute be like dude you're really smart you totally figured this out dude from blink 182 <laughs> like you want to work for the cia <laughs> these are definitely all truths dude yeah it's like a part of me it feels bad for that guy because i'm sure he is like dude i'm figuring it out but like yeah. he's not figured it out yeah now he's a mouthpiece for this pretty shady social engineering absolutely project yeah i don't want to get into that but i'm not going to really get into that here i don't want to get into that kind of stuff i can't say who they were but no no i just can't tell you who it's from okay and i was saying some other crazy that i can't repeat that's the i can't tell you you don't know what i know right well I what know. do you know though that i can't they don't know i can't tell you you i always tell me you don't know what i know like i i have meetings with senators coming up like do you oh yeah what I senators i can't tell you um and so it brings to the question, why would they do this? What is the purpose of manipulating people in such a way? Yeah, what would be the benefit? Yeah. Well, Charles Upton writes about his thought on that question. He says, my own depressing hypothesis is this. Various groups of occultists or black magicians bent on world domination, some of whom seem to have ties with the intelligence community and who may or may not possess interdimensional technologies provided or inspired by the jinn are staging deceptions for three purposes. One, to divert public attention from other activities they wish to hide. Two, to influence the mass mind toward a major paradigm shift away from religion and objective science toward belief in alien visitors. And three, to invoke by mass suggestion and sympathetic magic the demons that they worship. And that's from page 35 yeah. of Alien Disclosure Deception. And we might as well go through each one of those. Yeah, for sure. And the first one is to divert public attention from other activities they wish to hide. First secret thing they... experiments, any kind of governmental craft, for sure. Yeah, secret experiments, or or just uh, just some kind of mass distraction. Yeah, just to keep people occupied, keep their minds in a certain place so that they don't really think about any of the other weird things that are going on. It is a good cover story. Because there are a lot of theories that they do have these um, like anti-gravity yeah. vehicles and they're just all these secret government projects. So it's a nice it's a nice way to kind of bury that and say, oh, it's a it's a UFO. It's like an interdimensional. Yeah. Just a different narrative so that people to throw people off their trail. That makes sense. Yeah. That's like one of the long going conspiracies is there's like somewhat of a breakaway civilization with elites where they have some kind of zero energy technology based on the. The Schumann resonance current of the planet or whatever like the, the earth makes like a vibration hmm. and they try to like find a way to attune 
um, devices so that they can get energy from the planet's inherent vibration. So in the same way that like resonant frequencies can break a glass, they're trying to find a way to like use the Earth's vibration and magnetic fields to power things that pretty much give you infinite energy. And yeah. people have said that they've come up with those before and have gotten killed, you know, like the stuff gets weird with all that kind of stuff. But they're, you know, the elites might have some weird kind of technology that modern people would be like, that's impossible. Yeah, and I get I get the feeling that has to do with stuff like kind of like Tesla's Yeah, absolutely. Uh, discoveries and yeah tesla was like shooting electricity like beaming electricity from towers and stuff like 100 years ago mm -hmm. like, like tesla did like some kind of magical stuff and he said it had to do with like resonance and vibration and frequencies and stuff so like i think that there definitely is technology we don't understand very well and it very well might just be hidden by elites who are trying to yeah now larp is aliens to bring in some kind of world government or whatever they would like yeah which is the second thing to influence the mass mind toward a major paradigm shift away from religion and objective science and toward belief in alien visitors. Jay Dyer actually brought up recently on one of his programs this document from the Brookings Institution. Uh, I thought this was interesting. It's from 1960, and uh, the Brookings Institution is a Washington, D.C. think tank, which was funded by Carnegie Money. Yeah, if you don't know who those guys are, look them up and see what the things they, they're for. <laughs> Yeah, um, but they had a they had a document came out in 1960 called Proposed Studies for the Implications of Peaceful Space Activities. And there's a section in there uh, that's called The Implications of a Discovery of Extraterrestrial Life. And they speculate in that section that like on the impact that this would have on human values. And one of the one of the big things that they they talk about is how it would make people more receptive to a one world more unit more unitary united one world government kind of thing they don't necessarily use those terms but to my mind that's what they're kind of pointing at the knowledge that life existed in other parts of the universe might lead to a greater unity of men on earth based on the oneness of man or on the age-old assumption that any stranger is threatening and that echoes that thing that um reagan said yeah absolutely he said something like, well a lot of politicians actually have been quoted as saying stuff like that but reagan's quote was i occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world which brings to mind the plot of watchmen oh yeah totally like because the the villain in that his whole thing was he actually kidnapped like a bunch of uh movie like special effects movie people to help him stage an alien it didn't happen in the movie it only happened in the in the comic book yeah i thought that was interesting that the the plot of the movie was different than the comic book yeah at least about that key kind of interesting part yeah they make like a fake giant squid like alien squid to attack new york city yeah to basically usher in a new world a yeah. one world government to, to unite humanity against yeah. the alien threat but it's all staged yeah i mean enemies are things that bond people because groups need something in common and disparate groups that don't have anything in common it's actually really easy to be like you have a collective enemy that'll fight all you guys like you guys have, might have squabbles about minor things but like these guys are going to kill you and then it will force people to like team up and that's yeah. another example of kind of subliminal contradiction because on the one hand they'll they'll portray the aliens as these threatening invaders but then on the other, the, they're like more highly evolved spiritual yeah. beings that can help us evolve yeah, and guide us towards them. And then there are all these different theories that try to reconcile those where you yeah. get like um, the Pleiadians versus the reptiles, the Galactic Federation of Light. Yeah. Um, and then that's part of like the deferred closure of trying to trying to reconcile these subliminal contradictions. Didn't you know somebody that was into the galactic federation or something yeah totally i knew yeah i knew a guy a long time ago who i mean i must have been like 18 or 19 when i met him he was a super cool guy and he was into conspiracies too so it was cool to be like oh cool like the illuminati you're going because that was just the language we used when you were younger and he was yeah i was at like a party like actually on like an off-grid commune that was pretty cool and he was like he was like oh you've never heard of like the galactic federation and i don't know how into it but he was definitely the guy that like brought it up to me and then yeah like watched a bunch of like weird channeling stuff online for a minute i always got bad vibes about the channeling stuff and then one year when i was at burning man similar thing there was like a tent there where i saw someone like channeling what they said was like an interdimensional consciousness or something and their voice changed and it was like 
It was definitely, even having been ter- interested in the occult, man, I always had bad feelings about that. Do you remember what it said? Vague, new agey stuff. I mean, I didn't stay for too long because like Burning Man's interesting without that. I was like, dude, I can find yeah. something else that's less weird to do, <laughs> you know? But it was it, vague, new agey kind of stuff. Uh-huh. And some of those things are really weird too. I don't know if you've ever heard of Bashar. There's some people who say that they will channel like the same being. So there's like a dude, I think Daryl Anka is his name, and he says he channels Bashar, which is... I don't know if he describes him as like multidimensional. He's like a weird voice. And then I'm pretty sure there's a chick in Japan, like a girl who's like, I channel the exact same thing, (laughs) Bashar. And I don't speak Japanese, so like, I don't know how similar it is. But (laughs) there are a bunch of people who are like, oh, I talk to the same kind of being and he channels through me. And, you know, and he's yeah. supposed to be an, an extraterrestrial yeah. discarnate entity or something. Something like that. Or it, it gets kind of vague with all that stuff, but it's always some version of like... Yeah. Is some... that the one that says that like it taught Jesus or something? I'm not sure, but that is one of the common thing, like the ascended master stuff. Like it gets really common. It's like, Jesus is just one of us, dude. Like yeah. I'm also the Buddha and like it's just... <laughs> It kind of is like whatever you want it to be. They kind of yeah. show up to people and say things that fit into their worldview, mm-hmm. you know? And since you're dealing with something that you can't really see, you know, it's the kind of thing that it's like, oh, like, it reminds me of the spiritism of back in the day, like, get into a seance. It's like, well, this is my uncle talking to me. Yeah. You know, and it's like, oh, so you just, what you put on whatever your worldview is, you're talking to something, it's giving you information, and you fill in the blanks to what you think the thing is based on your worldview. Mm-hmm. That's not what it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, even back then in the 1800s when people were were doing seances and stuff, they some of the spirits would say, like, uh, we're space brothers from, you yeah. know, from outer space, from another planet. So it goes back yeah. a long way. Um, <laughs> it's so crazy. And it's and it's all part of the, uh, the changing of human values. And there was this other document that you brought up that I've heard of a lot about. Um, the changing images of man. Yeah, that from the Stanford Research Institute. Who also, they were the guys that did the men who stare at goat stuff. Yeah, I think so. They're like they do a lot of psychic things, a lot of stuff about the occult and uh, and spiritism and stuff. Yeah, they, totally. they study like all the paranormal stuff. And so does uh, Princeton has a version too. Pair, I think Princeton's <laughs> engineering is like anomalous yeah. research, something or something like that. Yeah, there's. Yeah, there are a lot of the uh, psych- psychical research stuff, but I mean, Stanford has theirs, and they came out with this document. What did you find about that? In general, the document wasn't for like public uh, consumption. It was more of just like think tank people and for like high up elites and stuff. Like, it wasn't something that was published for, you know, for like normie consumption that you could go and get at a library for a long time. Yeah. But one thing I found that the publishing of it was done by Robert Maxwell, Ghislaine mm. Maxwell's dad. Who hung out with the guy with the island, you know? I don't want to say it because the algorithm, but <laughs> that was an interesting kind of thing. Jeff Steen. Yeah, totally. McEffrey. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty interesting that he was the same guy. He was the guy that published the book. I have some quotes from the book, but in general, it's it's about them trying to study past human civilizations and, and the view, like the cosmological view of how humans fit into the universe and God mm-hmm. and kind of what will happen with certain changes and what the likely, you know, ways to predict how to change things into a new, like, paradigm, pretty much. Yeah, how how humanity sees themselves in relation to their environment yeah. and, and spiritually and all, just all of their Yeah, it, it, tries to, it tries to break it down like more like an algorithm. It's like if-then statements, like propositions and stuff. So it's like, well, if they think this about the world and this about God, well, then this is the conclusion logically. And look at these past societies and how they believed this and that meant that this follows from the premise. Uh-huh. So they're trying to come up with ways where they can like lead society. Introduction to the Pergamon edition. Changing images of man is an unusual work, one that enthuses some, displeases others, and leaves few neutral. It was undertaken for a specific purpose, to chart insofar as possible what changes in the conceptual premises underlying Western society would lead to a desirable future. Obviously, a research objective containing many value-laden assumptions. And then there's some highlighted things in here. Choosing as our research focus to concentrate on images of the nature of man in relationship with the universe. How past images have led to our present industrialized society with its crisis level problems and what types of images appear to be needed as we move into a post-industrial future. In the research on the world macro problem that followed, a second sobering conclusion has emerged, that an essential requirement for realizing any of the more desirable alternative future paths would likely require fundamental changes in the way our industrial culture is organized, 
laws, attitudes, ethics, even the very way we conceptualize the nature of humankind may require reform if they are to fit with and appropriately guide the complex interrelated political and social systems that have come to dominate modern life. We have met the enemy, and he is us. <laughs> it is difficult, perhaps even inappropriate, to assess the direct impact of the research report Changing Images of Man may have had on society. One reason is that the study was not published promptly. Hence, it did not enter the standard bibliographic reference systems that can be used for such assignments. Interestingly, until Irvin Laszlo, the, Pe the Pergamon Press, initiated their Explorations of World Order series, the study was judged unsuitable for commercial publication because it did not fall into the, any of the marketing categories that publishers conventionally use. A second a more and more significant obstacle to assessing the impact of the book stems from an increasing recognition since it was first released, that the emerging transformation of society seems to be proceeding by way of a diffuse network of interrelated influences, no one of which seeks to be a central project. Certainly many of the ideas contained in changes, Changing Images of Man are being debated and extended in a variety of settings throughout the society. Two recent books, New Age Politics and The Aquarian Conspiracy, describe much of the activity from a proponent's point of view. And that was from the intro? Yeah. <clears throat> Man, uh, oh, and then they just have the, the they have their own working def definition of image, image of man. Uh. We use image of man or humankind in the universe to refer to the set of assumptions held about the human being's origin, nature, abilities, and characteristics, relationships with other, and place in the universe. Wow, the form and content of that reminds me so much of the fourth industrial revolution absolutely just the way it's written and the and the way it talks about transforming humanity yeah uh the way we see industry and ourselves and our biology and how you know all the transhuman stuff and um there's definitely some uh some connection between those even if it's just the philosophy behind it <clears throat> they also lay out things that this is super interesting Despite the pessimism implied by a lagging dominant image, there are numerous indications that a new anticipatory image of humankind may be emerging. So they have signs when they think that there's going to be a new worldview coming in. And these are the signs. Youth involvement in political processes, women's liberation movement, black consciousness, ETC, youth rebellion against societal wrongs, e.g. protests against Vietnam, emerging interest in the social responsibilities of business, the generation gap implying a changing paradigm, an anti-technological bias of many young people, experimentation with new family structures and interpretational relationships, the emergence of communes as alternative lifestyles, the conservation ecology movement, a surge of interest in Eastern religious and philosophical perspectives, a renewed interest in fundamentalist Christianity, labor unions concerned with the quality of work environment, an increasing interest in meditation and other spiritual disciplines, increasing importance of self-realization processes. Hmm. And those are the things that they think are like ushering like the signs of when there's a new paradigm about to emerge. And so they take into account the, uh, the changes and also the reactions. Yeah, and... totally. Yeah. Like saying that there's, there's going to be fundamentalist Christianity is them recognizing there's a part of society that's not going to be like, oh, cool, let's just merge with machines. There's going to be traditionalist people who are like, yeah, this is bad. Yeah. Even if they can't explain like through geopolitical means why, like I think there will be a set of the population that will intuit that you might not want to implant technology into your brain. Right. You know? Yeah. Traditional people are going to react against this stuff. Yeah. And they've kind of taken all of that stuff into account, it seems. But it's obvious that they're steering us towards something which is a, new, a one world government, a one yeah. world religion, usher in this new utopia that they've uh, imagined for themselves. Yeah, I think they're going to play it like a dialectic. We're like, now that we've gone through such a long time of like modern atheistic materialism, I think like it's going to be the flip opposite, mm -hmm. where it's going to go from nothing is God to everything is God. We're going to hit like monism time, where it's like everything is kind of God and aliens are going to tell us that. It's going to go from the world that's like the sacred and the profane. Like in atheism, it's like everything's profane. There's no yeah. such thing as sacred. Just kidding. Now we're like new age. Everything is sacred. No, nothing's profane. Like yeah. we're going to just play dialectic game for a minute. That's exactly the process that Charles Upton describes with with the help of Rene Guénon, where it's like 
the materialist paradigm was anti-tradition and it came in and kind of cut us off from yeah. the put that dome over the the walled garden but he also says that that's not tenable because we're spiritual beings yeah. so we'll be starving for for spirituality and that's when anti-tradition turns into counter-tradition and that's something rene Guénon talks about in the reign of quantity and i think also in the crisis of the modern world um which is the deliberate attempt to replace religion with a a demonic counterfeit and which which is ultimately the uh the religion of antichrist um and so number three in charles upton's list of reasons for for this mass deception this ufo deception is to invoke by mass suggestion and sympathetic magic the demons that they worship i mean it's pretty well known that uh, a lot of these elites who are involved with secret societies are also involved with luciferian occult religious thought and uh probably one of the best examples of that is alistair crowley i mean he's the probably the most notorious occultist yeah. probably the most well-known um and he was also an intelligence agent um there's a book about that secret agent 666 he worked with mi6 and i think some other institutions crowley was pretty infamous for his magical workings and communing with entities he claimed to have been channeling a being called iwas that he called a discarnate entity which was also his guardian angel which was also the devil <laughs> um and then but if you talk to crowleyans they'll be like you're taking it out of context he didn't really believe in the devil it was like they try to psychol yeah, they psychologize like it, with the, well, it actually like well actually yeah. it's not really it's yeah not. They're like well actually the guardian angel is supposed to be like the perfect future version of himself and and the thing with a lot of the occultists too is like i'm sure at times Crow crowley will say those things and then at other times they'll say different things yeah that, like so it, it kind of is the thing where yeah. followers can look at it and be like dude he didn't mean that the 12 times he said it this one abstract reference in this one thing i read he said this it's exactly like, okay dude it means whatever you want it to mean yeah <laughs> pretty much um and so yeah he was doing stuff like that one one infamous thing was he contacted a different being called lamb which that's the one that looks like a gray right yeah it looks like yeah, a gray alien totally. it's like the first example of that kind of being and that's another thing where i think people that's I, that's supposed to be another aspect of his own self-consciousness of uh with like the big brain is supposed to be his like great intelligence or something like that <laughs> but uh so yeah and crow so crowley was an infamous black magician an intelligence agent communed with these discarnate beings and he had a protege named jack parsons who was an american uh astrophysicist he started jpl labs right jet propulsion laboratories jet, jet yeah, propulsion yeah. laboratories um and some other pretty famous places and he was also working on something called the babylon working and um i found this article by chris knowles at the secret sun who does some pretty cool work on this kind of stuff um, and it's called the Roswell Ritual. And so he goes into Crowley's Book of the Law and he finds some lines in there. The Book of the Law was the book that he he supposedly channeled from Iwas. And that's that's the book that has Do What Thou Wilt, one of his most famous sayings. But it also has this interesting reference to... He, he was apparently talking to a god who told him, I will give you a war engine with it. You shall smite the peoples and none shall stand before you lurk withdraw upon them this is the law of the battle of conquest thus shall my worship be about my secret house crowley's secretary this is all from the uh the blog article crowley's secretary kenneth grant would later write of jack parsons babylon working as the initiation point to the flying saucer wave of the 40s and 50s yeah so jack parsons was working he it was a magical working called the babylon working and um Crowley's secretary, Kenneth Grant, he thought the Babylon working was the initiation point for the flying saucer wave of the 40s and 50s. Yeah, Jack Parsons, he was working on all of this astrophysics stuff, and he would always open with, like, the hymn to Pan, and he was he was doing rituals. Yeah, that. didn't he have, like, an infamous, like, desert ritual? Yeah. With someone? And he died to, in... like, talk to beings from Venus or something and say that they do it? That sounds right. I mean, yeah, he, yeah, he just, he did weird stuff like that, and, um... He always opened with that prayer hymn to Pan, and he died in a mysterious explosion when he was working on one of these like magical, but also technological 
breakthroughs or something that he was trying to get at. Yeah, and so Kenneth Grant Crowley's secretary says that that was the initiation point for the UFO saucer waves. And, um, and Marjorie Cameron was was involved with both Crowley and Parsons. She was, she's an interesting figure. This says she was a naval intelligence officer, oh. which I didn't know that. But she said that at the conclusion of the Babylon working, she witnessed a UFO at Parsons' house. And um, she called it the war engine. So this is from like her, her account of it. It says, in March of 1946, Marjorie Cameron witnessed a flying saucer hovering over the parsonage. Writing about the incident to Jane Wolfe in 1953, Cameron associated the craft with the war engines promised in Crowley's Book of the Law, the flying saucers, the miracle, our war engine. I saw the first one in spring of 1946. So yeah, from all this, we're getting this idea that uh, these aliens are beings who can be contacted through ritual it goes along with like ancient occult stuff of people trying to talk to spirits and demons yeah. and invoking spirits you you know standing in circles and squares and that uh-huh. kind of, it's it's ancient magic dude. yeah and i mean probably one of the most well-known examples of that kind of thing is stephen greer yeah totally see and he's he's kind of i mean he's been on rogan and all over the place i think he has a bunch of netflix documentaries about ufos and he pretty explicitly sees them as religious beings that he can he can commune with by meditating yeah and he has retreats where he goes out into the desert and people meditate to summon the i think he gives people a protocol i forget what it's called but i saw one that was a youtube video it was like using stephen greer's protocol to summon ufos and Mm -hmm. it's like a father and a son and i don't think they get one to show up or something but i'm pretty sure that it is almost like an instructive like this is how to get them to show up kind of thing man yeah and i think stephen greer has like a really intentionally deceptive or just incredibly naive view on what's going on where he i think he says explicitly a bunch of times that they're all benevolent yeah that like every one of the things that could be up in the sky is like universally good huh which is definitely not gonna pan out right <laughs> like i don't think so no i don't think so either because the next thing we're gonna go into here is um john mack's book yeah charles upton brings up this harvard psychiatrist named john mack he wrote a book a while back i didn't i don't have the year in front of me but it's called abduction human encounters with aliens um and upton says that this is a very clear presentation of the ontological agenda of aliens mm-hmm. um because this psychiatrist dr mack he studied about a hundred ufo contactees and he kind of made psychological profiles on them and they all went through very traumatic experiences. Yeah, he's kind of like the guy who's known for talking about a lot of the things that people might not have known about UFO involvement. That like a lot of the takeaways after a certain amount of time are that it's almost overwhelmingly negative. Mm-hmm. It's not like what people see in like some gimmicky TV show where they have some experience and then it ends up being positive and transformative. Like most, he kind of writes that a lot of the stuff ends up being pretty traumatic for the people. But he also thinks that ultimately it is a it good, is good spiritual yeah. beyond good and evil kind of, that's exactly how he says i think he says a bunch of times which i like that charles upton kind of dunks on him for yeah that yeah john mack's position seems to be that even if whatever's going on is negative it seems to be like a catalyst for transformation and mm-hmm. that's cool he pretty much says in general that the whole thing is interesting and it's interesting therefore good yeah and he has this whole well first let's look at some of these experiences so on page 91, Charles Upton talks about some of these things that Max patients went through. He writes, The alien abductors subject their victims to terrifying and humiliating medical-like procedures. They also voyeuristically view them performing sexual intercourse or themselves have intercourse with them. One of the major agendas of the aliens seems to be ex- to extract human sperm and egg cells from their abductees so as to genetically engineer a hybrid human-alien race. It's just the modern version of a succubus and an incubus. Kind of, yeah. It's just the same kind of like, you're sleeping with the thing, but now it's wrapped up in a modern yeah. version. It's not the ancient, like, they're trying to take certain kinds of energies from you. It's like, they just want you to genetically, you're so special, they want to use you as some kind of seed to seed other planets. It's like, yeah. dude, it's not that. And that was a plot point in a recent, one of the recent seasons of American Horror Story. They had a whole thing about aliens coming and making hy- human-alien hybrids. Yeah. It was really gross. That show itself is just a really gross show. Yeah, I think I saw like um, part of one season was like, yeah, not really interesting to me. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, and there's that's another. T- I don't want to go into that tangent, but that show is crazy. Um, so where was I? Oh yeah, 
And female abductees experience these hybrid fetuses being placed in their womb, then somehow removed a few months later to continue their growth aboard the spacecraft. Um, but there's never actually any physical evidence that they were impregnated. These are just things that they're experiencing subjectively. After abduction, many victims experience themselves as now possessing or as always having possessed a dual human alien identity. They sometimes see themselves as performing the same procedures or experiments upon new abductees as were originally performed upon them. Among the case histories, Dr. Mack presents some of the most horrifying stories of demonic attack and possession I have ever encountered, though he does not recognize them as such. He admits that abductees bear physical and psychological scars of their experience. These range from nightmares and anxiety to chronic nervous agitation, depression, even psychosis, to actual physical scars, puncture and incision marks, scrapes, burns, and sores. And then Upton criticizes Mac for kind of siding with the aliens. Yeah, his worldview like makes it so you validate teachers doing horrible things as long as there's like the potential for growth. Mm -hmm. that's pretty much how mac looks at it on aliens i think yeah upton says like wouldn't that apply to like spiritual teachers like wouldn't that mean yeah, that gurus, psychologists and stuff be able to stuff. like sexually abuse people because it might lead to transformation yeah yeah exactly so he says mike or he says on page 92 mac appallingly believes that the influence of the aliens by and large is good he views his role as one of helping his clients to remember their abduction experiences often via hypnosis and helping them deal with the violent and horrific emotions such memories entail, and then helping them to accept that their experience is somehow ultimately positive, transformative, or spiritual. And he has this crazy, like, eight-step spiritual transformation. We, I don't think we can really get into that, but it's pretty insane. So it starts with ego death and accepting the death of the ego, and then ultimately experiencing a human-alien dual identity and then becoming one with the multi-dimensional consciousness that transcends the space-time matrix. Uh, there's so much crazy. That's It's so insane. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the alien-human dual identity thing sounds a lot like demonic possession. Yeah, absolutely. Where they have, they s somehow have this external invasive consciousness within them now. Like spirit possession? Like any of those forms of every kind of occult thing. Yeah. You let something in. Um, and then they attain to this multidimensional consciousness, which seems to transcend the space-time matrix, which kind of reminds me of the idea of singularity. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the, the loss of sense of self, the loss of personhood. Yeah, it, it kind of repeats the monistic thing that, like, if the one is good, the many is bad. So what's implied by all that stuff is not being, like, a particular, you know, mm -hmm. like, particularity is bad. You, it's like the universal is good. So in all those things, the ego death is good. It's not to remain the person you are and to go into the one. It's to dissolve the person you are to be the one. Yeah, and, and then Charles Upton says that this is, on a personal level, on an individual level, what these beings are trying to do to the entire human race. Like, this is their agenda for humanity, is to lead them through these steps of transformation. Which, you know, it it all points towards that singularity, utopia, new world order. Yeah. Melding of all into the super consciousness. The overmind from uh, Arthur C. Clarke, childhood, yeah. Childhood's End. The ultimate omega point of yeah. Talhard, Deschardin. Deschardin yeah. um, it's, it's so crazy. But it also shows like this kind of Stockholm syndrome. Yeah, totally. That these abductees have where they they are completely terrorized by these beings, but then they they end up having some kind of gratitude and loyalty to them. Yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with all of a sudden they get like they get like a view of themselves. It's like the changing images of man. Like the way that they view themselves in relation to the cosmos and God and other humans is like drastically shifted by these kinds of events. Mm-hmm. They have like a more meaningful place in the world now. Like I imagine someone working like a lame job doing something they don't like, kind of boring life. They could be like sports bro, just kind of not focusing on the highest of the things. And then all of a sudden, you know, you could feel like you get abducted and your sperm or whatever, you're going to be used as some genetic clone across the cosmos. All of a sudden, you're part of a bigger story. All of a sudden, they feel like they are the core of something. You yeah. Know? There's something mean. It's not just meaningful for them. It's like meaningful for human history or a cosmic history, you know, like. I mean, like this whole process of doing away with the traditional metaphysics 
and re belief systems and replacing them with a new one where these aliens are our new gods and there are all these narratives about alien creator gods genetically modifying humanity and being our actual creators and they want to be worshipped by us. On its face, all this stuff is so demonic. Yeah. And it's just so manipulative and uh, hostile and malicious. And he even makes a note of being like, if if these things are supposed to be these more evolved beings who are helping us evolve past our present state, why <laughs> why would that be a good thing? <laughs> yeah. Like, because he's like, I don't believe in evolution anyway. Hot take. Don't believe, yeah, don't yeah, believe totally. in evolution. Yeah, I mean, it's so against like the traditionalist perennialism is like the threefold. I think that, that him and Genelon and stuff think there's like a threefold way into union with God. And it's purgation, illumination, um, and theosis. Yeah. yeah, totally. And that's that's an orthodox yeah, totally. perspective too. Yeah. So the, he looks at this kind of thing where, you know, there's no purgation or anything. It's just like space things. You're like insta illumination and union with God. It's like, yeah, dude, one of the steps is missing. You're not cleansing yeah. and there's no purgation. It's like, sorry, dude. Yeah, because he talks about how the great chain of being, the hierarchy going from the material realm to the divine realm. Yeah. Instead of being vertical, now in postmodern thought, it's been... Uh, horizontalized yeah. so that we're going towards this teleological endpoint, which seems to be singularity and transhumanism and all this stuff. Um, and these beings of greater consciousness are leading us toward leading us through this process of transformation or transmutation. Maybe yeah. Yeah. is a better word to say. So uh, aliens are demons and they're, and the and the government is working with them yeah, pretty much <laughs> to engineer a new religious consciousness to bring in the reign of antichrist the one world government one world religion um and uh i mean that seems that, that that's that's just what's going on and that's the thing that makes the most sense i yeah, mean I think it's the most coherent of the views of we what have, could be going on yeah i mean we have a christian bias but even, like, the Christian bias, I think, explains more. Like, the Christian bias of being, like, these things are being deceptive, and they want to be, they want you to feel like you're a god or treat them as gods. Yeah. It, it goes along with way more. Like, I think if people sincerely look at all the channeled stuff and try to compare it with other people's channeled stuff, dude, someone's being lied to. You can't have, like, a hundred conflicting narratives from different, from different sources saying, like, well, this guy's totally not true, this guy's not true, mm -hmm. and then just accept all of them, you know? Yeah, it has, it has more explanatory power than anything else. It ties all of the threads together. Yeah. It's the most holistic way of looking at it. Yeah, for and sure. And a lot of, and that's why Upton is so about it because a lot of the traditional religions have the same kind of like, yeah, you shouldn't mess with the stuff. Yeah, whatever this is is being deceptive. Yeah, it's nuts. So yeah, that's the uh, first chapter of Charles Upton's book. It's it's pretty good. It's it's really challenging, especially. I mean, it's definitely not an Orthodox Christian book. I think I've said before, but I agree. I agree with most of it from a distance. Yeah. I have certain things that I would I would definitely uh, I would definitely push back against as far as like the perennialist take on everything, but for the most part I think it's spot on. Yeah, it's worth a read for sure, especially if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Upton does good work. He's a good author. He's a cool guy. Yeah. No, yeah, I have a lot of respect for, for his stuff even though I disagree with him on some things. On some very fundamental, important things. Yeah, totally. But, I mean but yeah, you don't want to just start a fight when you guys do agree on things. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess we could start wrapping it up. Cool. There. Uh, follow our Twitters. Follow Twitters. I'm Metal Mystic on, on Twitter and YouTube. Watch watch my music history, occultism. Yeah, uh, watch the sick documentaries. Documentaries. I have one on King Diamond and Levain Satanism. I've got one on Ronnie James Dio, Richie Blackmore, and Ouija, Ouija Board Phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to come out with a sequel to that hopefully sooner than the Dio later. one right yeah yeah a sequel to the Dio one yeah. i'm doing more deep dives on kind of his philosophy but i don't know how long that's gonna take i'm still doing i got some books coming i got yeah. some research to do but uh and it takes a while jordan puts out really good content so it takes a while don't want him to rush it you know so <laughs> <laughs> thanks for yeah. saying that but uh yeah um anything else uh god bless bye
know. Just keep watching. It's unbelievable.